come on, no golf claps this morning. No golf claps. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Bravo to you. Thank you to you. What you've done, the way that you partnered with us and with the Lord Jesus Christ to see some wonderful things happen this year. One of the, one of the stats that um, was not on that screen that I'm totally pumped about is just the way that you guys have risen to the occasion when it comes to serving, to partnering. So this last core value that we talked about, you've seen, connect, commit, contribute your time, your talent, and your treasure. Why is that important? Uh, Because it's not just about us. We're not in this just for what we can get out of it, but for the last three years, we've seen an increase of 1% a year. That might not seem like a lot to you, but it's a big deal to me because when we started measuring about four years ago, less about 10% of the people were serving on a weekend. That means that one person had to carry 10 people on their back. As of last Sunday, we've gone up to 14% people serving on a weekend. That means that one per seven, I think that load is a little bit lighter, and I praise God for that. I'm really grateful. Thank you for serving. And we want to be a church where people grow both deep and wide, that we're not just into numbers. Uh, We are into numbers because God is into numbers. God cares about growth. And God cares about people being added to the church. I'm never satisfied. I've got a holy discontent inside of me. So grateful for the numbers that have been baptized in the last year. In the first quarter, uh, first month of this year, we've seen an increase in salvations. I praise God for that, but I'm never satisfied. Are you? No, because God isn't satisfied. God, is, God loves every person that comes to him, but he always wants to see more. The worldly principle says it's more blessed to receive than to give. All you got to do is watch commercials and you'll see that the way uh, the world thinks that your life can be better is to buy more stuff. Uh, The bigger is always better. And the the kingdom of God, however, is the opposite because uh, God says it's more blessed to give than receive. Actually, to give of ourselves is where we find joy. So you're not going to find fulfillment in life by simply attending church. And if you're just an attender this morning, we're glad that you're here. I'm so happy that you're here. I hope you feel welcome and that you're among friends. But your personal fulfillment will not begin to rise. Or what, let me say, it's dependent upon the amount that you engage, the amount that you uh, give of yourself. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So in the spirit of that, I want to take a few minutes today just to talk about what God has done and to maybe challenge myself and to challenge us on what I believe God is calling us to do. You guys remember several years ago when the movie uh, came out, Super Size Me? Anybody old enough to remember that? So the guy... um the guy by the last name of Spurlock, the idea was that in 30 days that he would eat everything on the menu at McDonald's, and when they said, would you like to supersize it, he would always say yes. So he always supersized it, and he gained 24 pounds in one month. His cholesterol went up to 230. All kinds of problems started happening happening in his body, and of course, they just remade uh, a remake of it, I think it was last year, Super Size 2, revisiting those same things and seeing if anything had changed. It took him 24, uh, 14 months, rather, to recover his health and get his weight back down. So here's the point. Bigger is not always better. Uh, we're living in the land of America, Super Size everything, mega everything. And I asked the question this morning, is bigger always better? Well, big things are good in some cases, but not in other cases. Uh, We sometimes use the phrase, healthy things grow. I would say also, unhealthy things grow. (laughs) So all you got to do is come and see my yard in the spring, and you'll see some things that are unhealthy that grow as well. I can't figure it out, but it's like you, you kill nut grass, or you kill those thistles, and man, a week later, they're this tall. Uh, they, need to, they need to package that stuff and, and, and use it for other things, but oak trees take a long time to grow. 
Thistles take just a short time to grow and it doesn't take much effort, but oak trees take a long time to grow. And one provides shade for others and one is a hassle and just prickly. And I don't want to be that kind of church. I don't want you to be that kind of Christian. I don't want to be that kind of Christian. But today we're going to celebrate what God has done and also talk about where we're going, what we believe God is calling us to do. Because growth, we believe God wants his church to grow. Amen. Amen. God wants you as a Christian to grow. God wants his kingdom to grow, but he doesn't just want us to grow wider. He wants us to grow deeper, deep and wide. Because if less people are serving, it's less people are getting saved, and we're just transferring members from a church down the street, uh, that, that isn't God's idea of growth. Now, I want to look at God's Word, and if we could just get the lights up just a little bit more this morning, and I'd love for you to take your copy of God's Word, if you would, or pull it up on your phone. Matthew chapter 28, I want to read where Jesus gives his last words to his disciples. Matthew chapter 28, and you guys know that the last thing that somebody says before they leave In this case, he isn't dying, but he's ascending to his father. Matthew 28, after the 11 disciples have gathered back, who's missing from the disciples? Judas, yeah. So he has forsaken the Lord, so that means that even the best pastor in the world sometimes loses people. Jesus was the perfect pastor, and yet Judas left. And Judas leaves, but the 11 are still there. And Jesus says in verse 19, I want you guys to read this with me and read it out loud. Here we go. Go there. Yeah, that means you. (laughs) Here we go. Go therefore. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus is outlining his last words. This is called the great what? The great commission. So this is what Jesus is telling his disciples as he's leaving. Leaving. What kind of church does Jesus envision? He envisions a church that is going, yeah, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. He he envisions a church that is baptizing. He envisions a church that is teaching. So he's envisioning a church that is making disciples, not converts. Thank God for converts, but that's not what Jesus is into. Jesus is into disciples. He's into truly devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And not only that, he says, I am with you always to the end of the age. So he says, this isn't going to be something that you do by yourself, but I'm going to be with you. So one of the things I like to say and challenge us as a church is to say that God's church should be a gospel-centered, disciple-making, mission-focused, spirit-empowered church. All of that. He's he's into a church that is, first of all, gospel-centered. What is the message? The main message of the church is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that impacts our lives, that God has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And you guys that are students of Scripture talking about right now, but he's redeemed us from sin or from ways of life that we could not escape and brought us into the kingdom of his son that he loves to cause us to live differently, to be like Jesus. So we are, we are gospel-centered, we are disciple-making. We're making disciples, not just converts, and we have a mission focus that is outward and not just inward. And we are spirit-empowered, that is, we believe that all that we do, we cannot do except Jesus helps us. Can I get an amen this morning? So we are gospel-centered, disciple-making, mission-focused, spirit-empowered church. So what did it look like? What happened in the book of Acts after Jesus said this? Well, the church grew, but it didn't just grow in numbers. It grew in health. 
And they lived differently. They loved one another. They're, the walls between races and the, and the divisions between uh, ages actually begin to fall. And we started seeing in the book of Acts old people and young people and blacks and whites and people from all different generations and nations working together. So the church grew, but not in, just in numbers. It grew on the inside. And what happened was that people that were on the outside became insiders. This is what the gospel does. It brings outsiders and makes them insiders. Makes them, makes them love one another. Now, healthy growth is when we're growing on the inside as well as growing in numbers. Now, you guys are, you guys are the cream de la cream. You're here in the first service. You guys are legit. You guys are the smart class. So you guys know that in America, we're seeing a fall off in church attendance. We know that in America, we're actually seeing a fall off in people uh, as far as generationally staying committed to Christ and, and the younger generations nationwide, not in our church. We don't see this as much. We do see it, but we're seeing a fall off in, in the next generation and in their commitment to Christ. And some of those numbers can kind of scare us because we know that about something like 75 to 80% of those who become followers of Jesus do so before the age of 18. That means that we must have a strong commitment to children's ministry and student ministry. And I'm so proud of our servants and volunteers and partners. In fact, some of you, that uh, many of them are serving right now, but if there are any uh, children, workers, partners, people who serve in student ministries or children's ministry, would you stand right now in this room, wherever you are, balcony on the floor? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, stand up, stand up a second because I want to say something to you and I want the church to hear it. What you do is not just babysitting, that you are making disciples and Jesus cares about what you do and he is alongside of you and he is empowering you and he's saying, go, go, go. And I'm saying, go, go, go in Jesus' name. Now let's applaud. Thank you so much. So proud of you, proud to serve with you. But the reality is that, that many in the next generation are falling away. Now, this is typical. It happened uh, to myself and my wife in different ways that after turning 18, you kind of go through what? You go through the rebellious years, yeah? How many of you never left the rebellious years? I'm just wondering. How many Bon Jovi fans do we have in the house? This is my life. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for not raising your hand now. But typically, we do that. When, we, when we've come to faith as a child and then we hit about 18, we're like, I'm not sure I want to do what my parents have done. And so we kind of test the waters. and we walk, we walk away from the Lord sometimes and we try things. And that's kind of typical. It's not unusual for that. Many, many of them, many of us came back as we, whether you had kids or you got married, and you go, I don't think my parents were so dumb after all. Like Mark Twain said, it was amazing how smart my parents became when I reached the age of 21. Yeah, that was a joke, guys. They didn't get any smarter. You just realized that they weren't so dumb. And so this happens as we, we come back to the Lord, many of us, but what's happening in this next generation is that's not happening at the same trend. And so this this little graph here, I, I know I, I've got to do this this morning because I want you guys to get some of the bare bones facts. So this is the reality. The silent generation, born before 1945, 84% identify as Christians. Look at the difference in those born after 1980. Less than half identify as Christians. So we're not talking anymore about people that are 20, 25. Many of these people are 35 and 40, and they're not identifying as Christians. Well, that's kind of a statistic we don't like. You guys aren't applauding that, and I understand why. It's something that disturbs us, and what are we going to do? Well, some people would say, well, you know, that's just the way it is, man. These young people today, they just ain't committed, and they need some hardships, and we need a world war to try to get people back to what's important. 
You know, they just, they don't have to have hardship. And man, when I was a kid, we walked to school both ways and it was uphill and through the snow and all those sorts of things. Or maybe people today are just lazy and it's a pagan culture and it's where we are. But the New Testament says something completely different. In the New Testament, during the time of Jesus, it was a primarily pagan culture. There were multiple gods. There were people on all kinds of streams during the time of Jesus. Yet Jesus and his disciples were under at least 30 or under the age of 30 when they started their ministry. So your founder your, that you follow, if you're a Jesus follower, was 30 when he started his ministry. I'm just curious, anybody under the age of 30 this morning in this room? Most of them will be in the second service. Yeah. <laughs> your follower... Your founder, the Lord Jesus Christ, was older than you when he started the church. That's remarkable. And as a church, we should not, we should not apologize when we see young, young people lead. Uh, we don't, you know, people under the age of 30, I don't consider young, I just consider them adults. I'm not getting in, in many amens, but it's still true. So what are we going to do? I think, and this is just me talking this morning since I have the microphone. I think, I think the reason that people are falling away isn't because they're a bad generation. I think it's because Christians are not Christian enough. That there are less distinctives between who the church is and who the world is. Now, some of you are going, want to go, amen, yeah, we need to quit smoking, quit chewing, quit hanging out at bar. No, I'm not talking about that. Those things are important. But the significant detail here is that are we like Jesus? Are we like our founder? And I wonder if we became more Christian if the next generation would go, maybe there is something to it. The first Christians, the most powerful witness they had was the fact that they loved each other. The most powerful witness that we as a church can have is in how we love and treat one another. John 13 and 35, you know it. Jesus said, by this all will know that you are my disciples, whether or not you keep the Ten Commandments. No, that's not what he said. How will they know? that we're his disciples, by the love we have to one another. So they, what happened in Acts 2 is it says that after the Spirit was poured out, then Acts 2, that they met in the temple and house to house. In other words, they had large worship services and they had small groups. Large worship services and small groups. Andy Stanley says it's hard to do the one another's of the Bible sitting in rows. Church doesn't happen in rows, it happens in circles. The beautiful one another commands in the New Testament, let's, let's talk about some of them. Forgive one another, love one another, bear with one another, encourage one another. Those cannot happen largely in rows on a weekend. Where they happen is in circles. The one and others of the New Testament that are not there. It's remarkable when you think about some of the one and others that we sometimes fall into that are not in the New Testament, like this one. Avoid one another. <laughs> Scrutinize one another. Criticize one another. Pressure one another embarrass one another. Those are, none of those are in the New Testament. Anybody glad they aren't? I'm glad Jesus didn't say, hey, do this. No. He says, no, do, do this. Love one another. Encourage one another. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. Why are they not in the New Testament? Why are those other ones not in the New Testament? Because they are anti-Christ. They are not in the spirit of our founder. Now, we believe that the gospel is demonstrated in how we 
treat one another. What we truly believe in our soul is demonstrated in how you treat other Christians. So, for example, if you believe in a self-help gospel, if you believe primarily it's about how hard you try and you just try to make a better life for yourself, you know how you'll treat other Christians? You will treat other Christians as optional relationships that you don't really need. If you believe that the gospel is primarily primarily about your prosperity and your health and that God just wants you to be rich, wealthy, and healthy, and that's God's goal for your life, you know what will happen is that when people go through difficult times, you'll abandon them and avoid them. If you are a legalist, if you believe it's primarily that you do certain things to get uh, merit with God, then you will be unkind to others. But if you believe that God sent his son to die for you and you didn't deserve it and I didn't deserve it and that Jesus Christ came to say to us, basically this is Timothy Keller says, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. That in, and that in a nutshell is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you believe that, then of course we will bear with one another. Are you kidding? Because I'm a sinner that's saved by grace. How could I not forgive others? Of course we will love one another and care for one another. But if Christians are just like the world, if we treat each other as optional, if we walk out on each other and say that relationships don't matter, then the next generation will say, I don't see the difference. But if we become more gospel-centered, Christ-empowered, saying that relationships are important, that friendships matter, that my brothers and sisters in Christ matter, that that can be the most powerful witness of the gospel. So, I have a big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG. Are you ready for it? My hope and prayer for our church, and I've talked about this with our pastors, many of our leaders as well, is I'm believing that in the next few years, we will see 80% of our weekend attendance in small groups. You guys are just going, yeah, go ahead, pastor. Just dream, 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 dream. Hey, I'm serving Jesus Christ. All things are possible. Well, why not 100%, Sean? Hey, I'm not Jesus, you know? And there will always be people who want to remain anonymous, and I understand that, and you're welcome here, you're among friends. But you will not flourish without being in a small group where people know your name. That's, just not, a, that's not just a mantra for cheers. It ought to be the kingdom of God. Sometimes you just want to go where everybody knows your name. You guys, you guys, cheers, that's like, when was that, like 50 years ago? Hey, I, I can't help it. I'm not a TV aficionado. I used to see small group as being optional for me. I used to think, hey, I'm a pastor. I don't need it. I've got Jesus. I've got the staff. I've got the team. And sometimes I would even think, you know, I just don't get anything out of it. I'm just confessing this morning. And God started dealing with my heart. God started whispering to my heart and saying, maybe it's not about you. Maybe you're supposed to be here for others. What a radical thought. (laughs) I'm not here for me. And so when I'm saying what's in it for me, that is anti-Christ. When I'm saying, well, I'm just here for me. What do I get out of it? Then I'm not being like my founder. My Jesus came from heaven to make outsiders insiders. 
And so what I found, instead of measuring success of my small group based on what I'm getting out of it, I start measuring success of my small group based on what I'm giving. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And I praise God because it's happening at Cross Point. I am encouraged, my friends. I am encouraged. Because we, when we started, when I started feeling like, man, we've got to get people in smaller groups as we grow. And we started trying to do this. We had in 2017, we had about 20-something percent of our people in small groups. But here's the trend over the last few years. Each year, we kept climbing a little bit of our weekend attendance. Worship weekend attendance, we're seeing an increase of people saying small groups are not optional. They are needed to help us flourish. So that last year we saw, last October, last semester, we saw 46% of our weekend attendance in small groups. And that's a reason to celebrate and thank God. It's happening in our small groups. Just this last Wednesday night, we interviewed Jim and Sherry Greninger. And they said this as they were on the stage and they were, we were talking with them and praying with them and they were praying with us. They said this, I don't know how we would fight. And th- they are in a season where they're fighting a very grave illness and fighting it so bravely. But they say, I don't know how we would do this without our small group. They get it. They understand. I heard about another small group where there was a member that was going through a difficult time. They needed a new stove. And the members got together on on the DL and started talking and said, what can we do? They mustered up the cash. They went and bought it and had it delivered before they could say, Jack split. I think that's wonderful. It cannot fulfill the one another's of the New Testament simply by attending church, my friends. You can be saved without going to a small group. Thank you, Jesus. Going to a small group doesn't save you, but you cannot flourish without being in relationship. Not only does the gospel make outsiders insiders, but it also takes what's inside and moves it outside. And we see in Matthew 28 and 19, it says, go to all the world. It's a mission focus. In the 1980s, the megachurch movement was really starting to explode. And a lot of churches were asking, how can we get people to come to church? What kind of church do we have to be to get people to come to church? And so churches started rising and growing, and that was a good thing all in all. And we started seeing God's sovereign hand on some specific ministries and pastors where we started seeing some churches grow to like 20,000. But at the same time, in the last few years, we've seen celebrity pastors begin to fall. And not every mega pastor is on a trip, on an ego trip. Some of them are. And what God is showing us is that It can't be just about how can we get people to church. We've got to take what's inside and take it outside. And so what God, I believe, is stirring Crosspoint to do and what I think he's stirring in my heart to do, and I pray that I can be faithful, is that we will take what's inside and we will take the mission to the people. Jeremiah 29, 11 A lot of people know that. It says that I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a future and a hope. It's a wonderful promise. A lot of people know that verse, but they don't know what the context is in Jeremiah 29 and verse 7. It tells the rest of the story where God says, I want you, while you are in exile, while you're in Babylon and you're away from your homeland, I want you to build houses. I want you to have vineyards. I want you to marry and have kids. And I want you to seek the welfare of the city where you are. Because in its welfare, you will find your own welfare. So in other words, as the city goes, God says, that's how you're going to flourish. And what God is saying, uh, that, that he loves the city and he loves the nations. He doesn't just love the church. 
I grew up in a church culture where most songs and preaching were about heaven and about holding on till Jesus comes in the rapture to catch us all away. And I think sometimes we can lose sight of that, and I, I will admit that sometimes as, as, church, as a church in, in modern Christianity that we can forget about heaven and eternity. At the same time, we can forget the mission to which we are called. Why are we here? Why don't we just take the people in the tank when they get baptized and hold them under the water until they quit breathing? And yeah, that was a joke, guys. Come on. Give me a break. It's because we aren't finished. It's because we have a mission. And that God loves, the, God loves the nations. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. He wants all people, all kinds of people. So the first church was Jews and Gentiles. And when you read about the Spirit being poured out in Acts chapter 2, you see all these different nations coming together, the Spirit being poured out, a signal that God was no longer just dealing with one kind of people. Now, how can we take the mission to the people? I praise God that Crosspoint is doing this in some ways. I thank God for those of you that are serving in Oasis, and you're serving the refugees right here in St. Louis. I thank God for some of you who are working at R3, and you're teaching the next generation how to have a life skill in East St. Louis rather than just repeating the poverty cycle. I thank God for those of you that are working at Lee May Manor every Monday tutoring children. That's a holy calling. Thank God for you. And I thank God that last year, each year we've seen an increase in people taking short-term mission trips, people going to Guatemala and India, like 50-plus people in the last year that have gone to Guatemala. Thank God. That's awesome. But not only is God calling us to be uh, people who go to church and then once a year go on a mission trip, but that we're taking the mission to the city every day, wherever you work, wherever you live, to your cul-de-sac. And the nations are coming to St. Louis. You know that just 15 minutes from here, in an area called Carondelet, about 12,000 people, that whites are the minority, and that there is almost a 10% of the population that is Hawaiian. Go figure. I didn't even know that. Like native Hawaiian and Hispanics. Latinos and Asians, just look at that multicolored graph showing the nations that are in Carondelet just 15 minutes from this campus. What are we going to do? I don't know, but it makes me excited somehow because I think what could it look like if we somehow got involved with what God is doing? Does it mean adopting a neighborhood? Maybe. Does it mean planting a church? Maybe. I don't know, but at least we ought to pray and thank God that he's bringing the nations to St. Louis because the gospel is about outsiders who become insiders and about Christians who take what's inside and take it out. This is, to me, the greatest and most wonderful part of the gospel story is that God in Christ comes where we are and didn't demand that we go where he is. He stooped. He descended. He lived among us. When you think about it, all the best stories are that way, aren't they? The prince goes to the forest to wake Snow White. The prince goes out into the village to find Cinderella. The hobbit leaves the shire to save Middle Earth. Marlin leaves the safety of his coral reef to find Nemo. Why do these stories speak to us? Because it's written in our DNA. And probably the best one of all is Hunchback of Notre Dame. I hear they're going to make a live remake of it. I can't wait to see it. But I hope they don't mess with the best scene in the whole thing. It's when Quasimodo is chained up in the tower and Esmeralda is about to be burned at the stake and his friends are saying, you got to go save her. And he's saying, I can't, I'm chained up. 
But as, as, as the fire is lit and Esmeralda is down there uh, waiting to be burned, Quasimodo says, I can't take it anymore, and breaks his chains and swings out of the tower down to the fire to grab Esmeralda and, and somehow swings back up to the tower. And that one awesome scene where he's standing there over the people, holding her up, and he says what? Sanctuary! Sanctuary! This is what God did in Christ for you and for me and why the mission is not an optional thing for us is because that God descended in Christ. He came to where we were. He says, you can't hold me back. I'm going to come to where you are and I'm going to bring to you, you to myself to give you sanctuary, to give you safety, to save you from what you can't save yourself from. We love that story because it speaks to us who often feel like an outsider. Now, those of us who were bullied in school like me, who have sometimes felt like I'm just so... to Christ. I'm praying that. Asking for open doors for the gospel. Secondly, lead a group or get in a group. That's one way of showing it's not just about me. Because it isn't. It's about people. God loves people. He left the 99 to find the one. God cares about the one. Lead a group or get in a small group. And thirdly, be a missionary wherever you are. That doesn't mean a megaphone. It doesn't mean a placard. It doesn't mean signs that say turn or burn. It it means simply being myself with my weaknesses, 
my strengths, my good qualities, and my bad qualities, and saying, I'm going to do what I can for Jesus Christ. Anybody up for that? I want us to, I want us to pray, and I'm going to ask the band to come, and that we would, we would sing a bit of this this morning. There is more to come. Whatever you've seen, whatever good things we've seen, praise God for the things God has done this year. There is more to come. We have much to do, but God is on our side. And I pray that you hear my heart this morning that my wife was telling me last night, she said, make sure you thank people and celebrate what we did last year and don't just tell them what we're going to do. I said, amen to that. Well, babe, maybe you could come up here because you're much better to look at. That there is more to come in Jesus' name. Would you stand? I want you right now to think about maybe somebody that you know. Who is your three? You go... I'm really hoping, praying that they come to Christ, that they know sanctuary, that they know the grace of God, the love of God in Jesus Christ. Fix them in your mind right now as we pray. How many family members do you have who don't know Jesus? We've got a few empty seats. Can you believe God that they will know? Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus. God loves them. He cares about them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that you have made outsiders insiders. You brought us into the circle of love, a community of faith. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you Ignite our hearts, unite our hearts, Lord. We have so much to be grateful for, so many things that you have done. We praise you for your goodness to us, Lord. We thank you for the 300,000 plus that we've been able to give to your work around the world to help plant churches and strengthen churches. We thank you, Lord, for the 1,500 plus bags of food given to our community. We thank you for those who have given their lives to Christ this year. Perhaps even today, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that there would be those who turn to Christ today. And Lord, we pray that you help us to see that there's more to come. That as long as we're breathing, you have something for us to do, some way for us to participate to love people, to see the lost come to Christ, to love our city, to seek the welfare of the city, the good of the city. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing it. Lead us, Josh. God, how great you are. Great things you have done for everything we've seen. There is more place our hope, our faith, our trust in you alone, Lord, that we will be spirit-empowered, led by the spirit, full of the spirit, full of Jesus. We can't do it without you. Our hope is in you. Our trust is in you. Can we sing that part, Josh? Yeah. All of our hope. 
Believers, would you raise your hand? All of our future is Lord, our hope is in you. The God who never fails. All of our faith is. All of our strength is. All of our future is. The God who never All of our hope. All of our hope. Mike and pray. <laughs> I believe in you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for the blessing that you have bestowed on this congregation, on these lives. Lord God, we trust you with our future. Yes, Lord. Yes. I pray, God, for every family that's represented here, Lord. Bind them together in the love of Jesus Christ. I pray for salvations, Lord. I pray that we will go deeper yeah. in your word and in relationship with you. Yeah. I pray that we'll be unafraid, God, that we will face the challenges of 2020, whatever those look like, God, in our homes, in our church, in our personal lives, in our health struggles, God, we will face them knowing that you are God. Yeah. You are. And the same power that raised you from the dead is alive and well in us and in this place. Lord God, use us. Overflow these seats. Overflow these lives. Yeah. May your blessing and your favor fall, God. Teach us, Lord. Show us. Show us, God, how to serve you with our whole heart. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. We love you, Lord. May everything we say and do honor and glorify you. Yeah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's praise the Lord. I'd love to, any of you that don't know Jesus, let me just tell you what you can do. You can take that card in front of you. It's called a connection card. Take it to the folks out at Next Step as you walk through the doors out on your left. They'd love to pray with you, help you in your next steps of faith. Amen. Don't forget Wednesday night. That's going to be really helpful for those of you that are parents and grandparents.